is Michael Duggan. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, what that means to me is I haven't had a drink of drug um, since April 14, 2009. My introduction to opioids began when I broke my wrist senior year playing hockey in high school. Before that, you know, I had experimented with alcohol and marijuana. You know, that also plays a part of my story that I think is important. Um, you know, as a three-sport varsity athlete, uh, loved playing sports, kept me out of a lot of trouble. Um, senior year in high school, we were playing in Hingham, Massachusetts, and it was about the second game into the season. I went to go check somebody and broke my wrist, shattered my wrist completely. Um, went to the emergency room and was given a prescription of, you know, opioids at the time to, you know, manage the pain. Um, looking back at it now, you know, there was no lesser alternatives that were given. There was no questions, no family history that was drawn. Uh, it was pretty much the immediate solution. Um, because of my injury, I, I had nerve damage and I lost feeling in my fingertips, so I had to go back and, and get surgery on my wrist uh, and also get the nerve damage repaired. And the solution after that was, you know, another prescription for opioid pain medication. So there was a lot of access, you know, to the drugs initially uh, from the doctors, and I didn't really understand the immediate dangers to these drugs um, at all. Um, and because of the injury, I was out of sports, so I had a lot of time now on my hands at the end of my senior year class, and you know, it's kind of getting to the end of, of school, so it was, uh, you know, more spent kind of, you know, partying at that time in my life, and um, with the prescription opioid pain medication, it seemed like there was an abundance of these drugs everywhere. You know, I had a lot of friends that also had injuries um, that were being prescribed medication. It just seemed like it was easier for my generation as an underage person to get access to illegal prescription narcotics on the streets than to get somebody to buy you alcohol uh, because of the accessibility of these drugs. And when you hear heroin, heroin has this such a name branding effect that terrifies a lot of people. Um, but when you hear things like Percocet or 30s or Oxycontin or 80s or Jams, you know, it didn't have that same effect. I mean, we really didn't understand the seriousness of these drugs and, and how they would completely take over your life once becoming addicted to them. So eventually, I, I, at first I didn't know that I had a problem to them. I didn't know I was addicted to them. Um, because I had a, a steady supply, you know, that was being given to me. And then I remember I went away on vacation that summer and my girlfriend's family had a house in Old Orchard, Be uh, Old, Old Orchard Beach in Maine and she invited us up there for vacation for the weekend and we went up there and uh, I forgot to bring something with me. And I remember the first night I was just deathly ill in withdrawal. You know, it was the first time I ever felt any sickness like this. Um, I was, you know, just, you know, hot sweats, just, you know, crawling out of my skin, tossing and turning, just, you know, completely restless and irritable. And, um, you know, I knew that, you know, it was because of the drug. So the entire time as I'm feeling these physical symptoms, there's also a mental obsession that I need to get something quickly to make myself feel better again. And, um, you know, the next morning everybody went to the beach and I, you know, told her family I didn't feel good, I had a flu, and uh, they believed me, of course, you know, because you know, the last thing they were gonna think was Mike's addicted to drugs, you know, I didn't, uh, we have this, you know, image of, of what a drug addict is, you know, but the reality is, is there's no such thing, you know, uh, you know, addiction doesn't discriminate, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, uh, the reality of the situation was that, you know, I was very much indeed addicted to these drugs. So I left and I went home and I met up with somebody and I bought, you know, one of these pills off the streets illegally and um, I felt immediately better. And at that moment in my life, I made a decision, you know, that I will never go anywhere again unless I bring something with me. And that's a real sad realization for a young 18 year old kid to make in his life that he's such a prisoner to these drugs that he can't even go away on vacation without taking them. So what happened in my life at that point is I honestly went from a period of having fun by taking these drugs to living in fear of withdrawal. So now ultimately my decisions were all based off of fear. And um, the only way for me to go to school and go to practice or go to work was I needed to take these drugs to just feel normal. So it wasn't even the thrill of getting high, it was just to feel normal on a daily basis to function you know, normally in society. So um, 
you know, that's, it, it just really started to spiral out of control at that point for me. And the prescription lasted a lot longer than the pain itself, and I think that's very important. Um, there was lesser alternatives that should have been given. Um, the reality is my family, there's a lot of history with addiction and alcoholism that wasn't looked at. Um, that should have made me more of a high-risk candidate for somebody who was being prescribed prescription opioid pain medication. Back when my parents grew up, or even my grandparents grew up, if you broke your wrist, you know, you were given Tylenol. You know, you were sent home with Motrin. You know, you weren't given, you know, the, the, you know, the most intense or strongest version of pain medication that's not necessarily for somebody who's, you know, just in that situation. And last year, actually it was about two or three years ago, I went to an urgent care because I had a bad cough. Um, and they tried to prescribe me 100 milligrams of codeine syrup. I mean, that should never happen, you know, and I think it's important for people to understand that they need to be aware of these things and not necessarily take the prescription that's given to them, but ask questions. You know, if they're not asking you questions, you need to ask them questions. You need to make sure that your family member is safe, and if they are taking a prescription, that it's something that ultimately isn't going to lead them down a long road that has long-lasting, you know, effects, you know, for something that might be an immediate solution that's given.